See, my journey started right here in Prince William County. Most people don't realize that, but I went to Lock Loman Elementary School, I went to Parkside Middle School, and I graduated from Stonewall Jackson High School. I also was a homeless teenager that used to sleep right over there. I was a teenager in my senior year of high school that I would carry a trash bag around this town. And I would go to school every single day and I would pray that people wouldn't laugh at me because I had holes in the bottom of my shoes. Or they wouldn't laugh at me because I couldn't tell you the last time I brushed my teeth. I prayed that the teachers who thought I was invisible really would look at me and realize that I was there. They never did. I remember on the day that I graduated from high school in Stonewall Jackson Senior High, I received a piece of paper, a piece of paper that most of you celebrated when you got it. To me, I felt it was a death sentence because now I had no place to go. The El Taco down the street on Centerville Road used to keep their bathroom door unlocked at night so I could go and sleep there, so I would be safe. But I was still invisible. See, for me, I wanted to know what happened to community. For me, I wanted to know where were you all at? So when I graduated and walked across that stage and that diploma was handed to me, as I said, I was scared. I didn't know what I was gonna do, but most important, I didn't know where I was gonna eat. See, I will tell you that the abuse that I suffered from my parents' hands, or the many times that someone entered the bathroom in the middle of the night and raped me, was nothing compared to what I felt in my stomach when I had not eaten for days. I'm telling you right now that there are people in your community just like me. So when I walked across that stage, I decided that I wasn't going to be the statistics that you all thought I should be. I was not going to fill our juvenile detention centers with my body. I was not going to break the law to go to a prison so I could have a roof over my head. I was going to show you that as a community, I had not given up on you and I was gonna make something of myself. So I joined the military. I jumped on a bus right here in Manassas and off to Fort Meade, Maryland, I went. And I joined the Navy. I remember the very first night at the MEP station, they put me up at the Red Roof Inn. It was the first time I think I can ever remember staying in a hotel. I remember shutting the door behind me and locking the door and laying on the bed and crying like I had never cried before. I didn't cry because I was sad. I cried because I was safe. There was a lock and I knew no one could enter. I knew that I was okay. And then I went and got in the shower and I picked up a bar of soap. And I remember scrubbing my body like I had never scrubbed before. Mind you, I was not scrubbing to take the dirt that you could see away, but the dirt that you all made me feel that I had inside because I failed you as a community. Life was rough, life was hard. But at that particular moment, I threw my trash bag away and I decided you will never hear my story. I decided at that particular moment that you all who judge on a daily basis would never judge me. Because if I don't tell you, you do not know. So I started on with my career. Little did I know 10 months in being into the Navy that my bladder would rupture. I will tell you that my bladder ruptured because as parents, as control, they thought it was funny not to allow me to go to the bathroom. And they would teach me to hold my urine until I could not hold it any longer, until I wet myself as a little boy and then they beat me. So after 19 years of that, your bladder can't take no more. Little did I know that the Navy was nice enough to give me surgery and to fix me and make me whole and then send me a one-way plane ticket to Dulles Airport with one month of pay and said, we're no longer in Egypt. And I became homeless again. 
Again, where was my community? I went to the public library right here in Prince William County and I took a manual typewriter and I proceeded to type on the typewriter a resume. A resume that was in my mind, but I never did. I wasn't going to be a statistic. And so I got a job and I worked and I worked and I worked. And I remember two years into my job after being transferred to Winchester, Virginia, and realizing that time was for me to be honest. And I went to my boss and I said, you know the resume I handed you? I lied. And I remember him looking at me and saying, why? And I said, because you were one of those people that would have judged me. And I remember him looking at me and said, you know what, get back to work. You work too hard for me to even think that this conversation's happening. And so at that point in my life, I started to continue on, and I climbed the corporate ladder. But again, I refused to tell people my story. And when people who got close to me that used to live in my same city and would talk about what I had gone through, I exited them out of my life. See, at this particular moment, I'm living in the city, and I'm hobnobbing with senators and doctors and lawyers. And the mayor of D.C. was my friend, and I went to dinner with him. <clears throat> And if he knew that I was a homeless teenager, would he talk to me? Would you have spoke to me? And so what happened about nine years ago, when it was time for us to have kids, I remember Re saying to me on a Saturday morning as we were drinking coffee, probably from a crazy cocktail party the night before, do you realize what a disservice you've done to all these kids? And at that particular moment, as the tears rolled down my face, I realized that I had become all of the community that I didn't want to be. That I had given up on so many children. How dare I? How dare I think that it was about me? How dare us all think that it's about us? See, I can tell you one thing. I tell this to my children all the time, that community was built for only one reason. It was built for you and I to take care of each other. It was not built for you to live in a home and your colors match. Your bushes are all the same. No, we built community for you and I to share. If you need a piece of bread and I have it, I should share that piece of bread. We have forgotten that along the way. So I proceeded to start at that point to start to say and tell people my story. I proceeded to start bringing back people in my life who had traveled that journey with me as a young boy. I also proceeded to forgive you all. Because first I had to forgive myself. And I had to forgive the community because guess what? You did not know. See, I truly do believe that if you do not know something, you cannot require change. Every single person that is sitting in this room is a leader. We all are leaders. You have one opportunity to get into a game and play. Today is the day. You will give, be given many options in your life. And as I say, life is about choices. Life is about knowing what you should be doing for your community and what you should not. Life is also about you making change. See, I say it all the time, you be the change that you want. You lead by example. There are three things that you must understand. Is number one, you must always use your listening ears. Every one of us has a story. Number two, you have to make sure you say your kind words. Look at your history books. Listen to my story. Never have we ever changed anything with hateful words. But probably one of the most important things that you could walk away from here tonight is to know that it is up to you to lead by example. It is up to you to know that as leaders, we must get in the game and we must play. See, this is your community. This is my community. It does not matter that I live in the state of Maryland now, or it does not matter that I have friends in Texas or friends in California. We are all part of the same community. And we are part of a community that must demand change. You are the ones that are gonna require that. 
as you took this class and you learned more and more about our school system, as you learned more and more about the county that you support, the city that loves you, I hope you also walk away with learning that it is up to you to continue to make sure other people love it as much as you do. That you have to make sure that you find people like me. There are children that are in your community today who need guidance. Last year, we incarcerated 1.6 million people in the United States. 1.2 million of them were connected to foster care. You tell me that our system is not shattered. We're looking at only 3% of kids in foster care who will go on to college because they do not have leaders like all of you to believe in them, to make them feel wanted. It is our responsibility as community leaders to make sure that we lead. I promised my children that. So when we started our charity, by the way, I never in a million years thought I would ever have a charity. By the way, I still work a full-time job, you know, <laughs> besides being a dad and a goat farmer and chickens, which, by the way, we knew nothing about it until we bought the farm. Thank gosh for you two. So, you know, I didn't think that this would be something that I would do. Right now, I was worried about four kids. I was worrying about a son who I was told was never going to talk and probably would never walk. I was worrying about three other children who came from the worst of worst, a mother of 12, a mother of 14. Probably the worst that we could all possibly imagine. That was my entire goal, was just to get them through. But then I realized that as a community, we were in need of something. We were in need to let children know and care that we cared about them. And to allow a child to carry a trash bag. Unacceptable. Where is the dignity in that? And then I started realizing that not only do we allow children in foster care to carry a trash bag, but we also do not provide them with the essentials on their first night. You know, it's hard enough to be in care, but it's even harder to ask. So we decided to make a charity, and we decided to do a couple of 100 cases. Our goal was 500 a year. That was it. That's at 25,000. We're now to up to almost 38,000 cases throughout the United States that we have given. Them. And I would let you know this. We are a 100% volunteer charity. Our charity is driven by our community. We have no corporate sponsors. Target is not knocking on my door to give me pajamas. Colgate has never called me once and said, let's give a kid a toothbrush. But what has happened is I have asked my community. I have told my community the story. I told them about the fact that as a little girl, when my daughter arrived at the age of four, she had eight cavities. These pearly whites that I have cost me almost a year's salary because I did not have a toothbrush. I also want to make sure that every single child gets a brand new pair of pajamas with a tag on it. A tag. People say all the time, why a tag? The very first night my daughter arrived, she was the saddest little girl in the world. And I thought to myself that she was never going to smile, but my gosh, I was a dad. And I was going to shower her with so much love, but she still was not going to smile. Until she came out of the bathroom with her new little pink robe on, and in the bedroom, my husband had laid three nightgowns on the bed. And she walked over and picked one up, and she tore the tag. And she turned around and she looked at me. And I said, Amaya, why are you smiling? And she said, Mr. Rob, I've never owned a new nightgown before in my life. That tag changed her life. She deserved a new nightgown. And so does the other 426,000 children in foster care. And then we want to make sure that they have a bar of soap. And if you don't think a bar of soap means anything, every one of you guarantee you will go on vacation sometime this year. Probably every one of you will go stay in a hotel. Before you arrive at that hotel, I want you to do me a big favor now. Promise me this. You'll call the hotel. You'll ask them to leave the bar of soap from the people before you. Take a shower. Use it. 
lather your body up. You won't. But every single day when a child enters foster care and goes into a new home, we require them to do that. I remember being that boy and could re probably didn't even remember what their names were. But you expected me to use that soap. It's called dignity. So we put a bar of soap, and then we put a book. A book. See, I was that kid who sat at the Prince William County Library until the librarian would walk over and tap me on the shoulder and tell me it's time to close. And I would grab my trash bag that I'd hid in the bush outside, and I would walk down 28 to the El Taco. And I'd go back to that public library and I would sit and I would read every single book I could get my hands on. And I will remind you as a senior in high school, no counselor came and pulled me out of class to say, let's fill out some college applications. No teacher walked up to me and said, great job with your B in English. Let's see about getting a grant for college. Because see, if you talk to me, then I'm no longer invisible. But that public library had a book for me every single day. So I want to make sure children have a book in their case because I want them to understand that, by the way, your skin color is not what separates you. It is your level of education. We must educate our children and every single child deserves an education, not only the ones with parents. And then the last thing that we do is we put a blanket in there. We put a blanket in there and it's not because I expect these kids to be cold. We put a blanket in there because my husband and I promised our four children when we started this charity that every single case would have a blanket. So that way, every single child who receives our case will take that blanket, wrap themselves up in it, Feel the love that the community gave them. See, that's what it was about. It wasn't about that case. It was feeling the love of your community. So now we make sure that every single case has a blanket. And my eight-year-old son will tell you, we call it a blanket love, blanket hug, and a community that cares. So as I finish this, I want you to understand one thing. You've heard my story. You know you're a leader. Now go out there and require change because only you can do it. I promise you that. Thank you.